when you go to a certain village and there's drought, people are moving from here and there, and you yourself, you go and introduce them the topic of FGM while they're suffering. We teach them how to approach the women, elders, in a best way that they will not fight you back. I wake up and my tents were written, Mr. FGM. So I was telling them, what? What the hell is this? Who wrote my tent, Mr. FGM? <laughs> <laughs> this is the NFGM podcast with Samuel Leadismo. Welcome to the NFGM podcast. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I spend time with change makers who are making an impact in Kenya and beyond. Each week, we listen to incredible stories of ordinary people just like you making a difference. They share their successes, failures, and what they are learning along the way. Thank you for being with me today. Let's get started. Both of us are Ma speakers, but in such a small world, we are able to meet in a different land. Today, we are here in Senegal with Samuel Leadismo, who is dressed in an amazing outfit, uh, something that the Maasai do not wear. I see his head is uh, colorfully decorated with uh, uh, flowers and feathers, and he's also colorfully dressed in beads and uh, samburu attire. I first heard about him uh, when the anti-FGM board was awarding uh, people who are doing a good job in their communities. And he was the male champion uh, against FGM uh, of the year. I don't know what the title is. Uh, the title was uh, the male champion of the year to, to end FGM in Kenya, 2018. 2018. And so I'm seated here with Samuel Leadismo, who hails from um, the northern part of Kenya. Karibu sana, Samuel Leadismo, and uh, it's an honor having you here. Thank you very much, Jeremy uh, uh, Kipainoi. I'm so excited to, to meet you here in Senegal. So my name is Samuel Leadismo. I'm the founder and director of Pastoral Child Foundation. Uh, we are community-based in Kenya, and we are a charitable organization, 501c3, in the United States. Our, our mission is to eradicate FGM uh, and child marriage, and also we promote child education uh, through scholarship in Kenya. Uh, basically, uh, I founded Pastoral Child Foundation in 2012, and my mission was actually to eradicate FGM in different pastoralist uh, counties in Kenya. We have did work in Samburu and Narok. We have an uh, empowered community. We have actually targeted women, elders, uh, school children, youth, uh, warriors to end FGM. And uh, we started with a community dialogue workshop. And uh, we managed uh, to empower community in both uh, Samburu and Narok. And uh, it's not that I see task because, you know, we are trying to tell the community about the effect of FGM, whereby, you know, FGM is a sensitive uh, issue because it is part of the culture in different community. So we try to use our best approach because we live with the community, we know how they live, we, uh, we are with them, uh, we are from the same community, and we know the best approaches to work with them. Uh, the first time it was a bit, uh, it, it was a challenge because it was a new thing for me for, from the same community to come and tell the community the effect of FGM. In spite of me, me uh, being a male, uh, most of the males were telling me this is women issue, not the male, not the male issue. Let the women uh, 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 solve their own problem and help themselves. But I said no. Uh, I am the father uh, of a daughter. That's why I'm fighting uh, for the right uh, of girls and women in Kenya. And uh, basically, uh, uh, so far the community actually, their response is positive because we are trying to educate them about the anti-FGM laws. We are trying to educate them as, as well about the importance of ed education because the more we take children to school, the more they will fight for their own rights. 
what is it like to be a samburu in in the fight against female genital mutilation how is it like how has the experience been like as a samburu man uh it's not that easy as a man uh, uh to fight for the right of women our culture is so unique we want to, to continue with our own culture but uh, uh the other things like fgm child marriage we want to to eradicate them in a manner that our community uh, uh will uh will actually listen to us we use the best approach because samburu community tend to listen to their own son and they are very good listeners so you're saying you want to get rid of other cultures you mean of course harmful cultural practices but also keep other positive practices yes yes because samburu culture is so unique and i love my own culture we want it to remain the way it is but if german child marriage we are eradicating them but it is something that it will take some time because the community need to be told about uh, the effect of fgm the anti fgm laws because i know my community doesn't aware of the laws but uh, we are trying to empower them to tell them about this anti fgm laws they've been practicing this this um harmful practice i'd say for hundreds of years i'd say and uh, we are now suddenly telling everyone to stop it because it's bad for them and some of them still are finding it difficult to uh and fgm because they say their grandmothers have gone through it their mothers have gone through it so why don't you want the daughters to go through it how is it like trying to get these people to accept that female genital mutilation is actually not not beneficial for them basically the best way is to promote child education to take more children to school and also to educate community empower them tell them uh, about the effect of fgm uh tell them about the importance of uh, education that's the only way that uh, the fgm will be eradicated in samburu community uh and uh using force or, or, or other forms to end fgm it won't work in samburu we need to use the best approach we need to empower them we need to encourage them to take children to to school i know when we use the best approaches they will end fgm you said best practices and you say that the samburu people are uh, can't be forced why uh, is there are instances where they get violent for example if the the police and forces come why why do you say that it's not possible to force them actually you know forcing uh, the community uh forcing them to change uh, what they have been doing since inception it's something so new to them it's new to to them so for me i i love my culture i love my community and i don't want to see a scenario whereby we force to 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 go and uh, uh and maybe take a certain family to a police and they are not aware about the fgm laws so we need first to take a, the empowerment workshop to the grassroots level empower the community and we give them time to change because i know samburu community they are very good listeners and uh, they will be ready to change but let's empower them let's show them the importance of education and i know fgm will end i agree with you that the the samburu people are are good listeners because i've said, i've sat, sat sat down with them and um i also agree with you that uh it's also important to engage them in trying to end female genital mutilation in a way that they can understand so that they can also make decisions knowing that okay you know i'm doing this but this is what happens to a woman or to a girl when she undergoes female genital mutilation so with you with that i agree with you but i know that the samburu community is in a very sparsely populated area where there are less and less uh, there is less and less um government presence and sometimes i'm told that even the people who are employed there are mostly locals because they are the people who understand the terrains up there and they are the only ones who can deal with things for example like banditry which exists in northern kenya so you talked about education and in the, in, in education uh, there is community empowerment where they understand what the law says what are the effects of female genital mutilation what kind of of fgm are they actually practicing and all those 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 details um how has it been trying to explain to them how do you do it do you mix old men and women and and, and the youth uh basically uh, uh we usually have the community dialogue whereby we reach uh, elders in a separate meeting then also we, we reach women in a separate meeting then later we bring them to, together to have a community dialogue 
uh, that's the only time that they can be able to extend the culture, uh, the origin of FGM, uh, and they will now rectify what work and what will not work. And also, we we reach you to do sports because we we usually have pastoral digital foundation annual tournament, whereby we we bring youth from different location to to play football, uh, volleyball. Then uh, we have like uh, four to three hours to empower them about HIV and AIDS, reproductive health, importance of education, effect of FGM, child marriage. You know that's the time now the the youth will speak for themselves. They will sp- they will tell tell us what they should undergo. And I think such kind of social activities, uh, I think uh, that's the best, uh, that's the best uh, way to go. And uh, every holiday, uh, actually, we shall have a mentorship program for both girls and boys in Naro County and Samburu County, whereby we reach youth from uh, grade uh, six to eight, and also we reach uh, student, the high school student uh, from Form 1 to Form 3. That's uh, basically we go to a certain school. We stay there for four days uh, with our experienced facilitators who are nurses, teachers, doctors. Uh, then we, we bring those uh, uh, students uh, to a nearby school for four days. Then uh, we mentor them about self-awareness, important of education, reproductive health, HIV and AIDS, FGM, etc., etc. And uh, we saw those are the best approach we can use uh, because once we empower about 70 students every holiday, when they go back to school, they will also empower more. And uh, engaging youth to end FGM, I think that's the best approach to reach more youth to fight for themselves. So you have an approach where you're not just dealing with the youth, you also deal with the, 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 the parents and also uh, in terms of both genders, the fathers and the mothers. And so you say that sometimes you don't mix them when you're starting off. Why, was the, why is that necessary? Actually, you know, first you need to, to, to request for, for a consent from the elders and the women if they want to be together. When they agree, that's the only way that you can actually bring them to together considering do not harm because you won't just go and call the elders and the women together and you'll go just directly and tell them and you start with the topic of FGM no first to go and teach them about the leadership skills women leadership skills HIV and AIDS then you go to reproductive health then automatically FGM and child marriage will come you know because going directly to the FGM topic I know the parent will walk and leave you alone so because we are living with the community we know what they want and uh, basically also we saw there is the best approach we can use as pastoral child foundation we usually also we also empower women economically both in masai mara and samburu in in samburu we uh, we actually constructed a kurosho for the women and they are they're actually selling their whole necklaces the tourists and definitely they will keep the money to help themselves. And also in Naro, we bought around uh, 25 bulls t- to women, whereby they will fatten, then they will resolve, then they will keep the money to assist themselves. But those now women group, they will be, uh, they will be pastoral child foundation champion, whereby we help the women to help themselves. Amazing, amazing. That's, a, that's, a, that's such a unique, and I think we'd like to talk about that in, in just a few moments. But there's something you just spoke about um, in terms of how to approach issues regarding FGM in communities. And you said, you know, you just don't go and start talking about female genital mutilation directly when you've not prepared these people mentally uh, sometimes. And it's happened to... to, to, to I've, I've seen such cases where people really have problems when they just come... On one day, day one, the first hour, and they want to talk about female genital mutilation and why it's harmful for them without really considering where these people come from in terms of culture and what they really, what value they really hold into that. Why is it so, so important to, you know, to prepare them mentally while talking to female genital mutilation? One, you know, this thing is something uh, the pastoralist community uh, were actually doing since inception. And it is a sensitive issue. 
uh, when I was starting because, you know, my fellow youths and other friends were telling me, you are, you are now coming to change our culture. Whereby I saw the best approach I can use. When I empower a certain community or a certain village, I will sponsor a child from there. So that's the time that I saw now the, the community tend to listen to me. When you empower them, then show them something positive by sponsoring a child in that village. And uh, going back to the point that you told me, why, uh, why are you using like that? Because using the best approach, you know, considering do not harm approach in the community, is the best way to work with them, to live with them, to stay with them, chat, get ex experience on how to end FGM. I wouldn't just go to the whole people and start telling them about FGM, whereby I will not just go directly and teach them. We have so many cases of gas being cut over time in Samburu specifically. But I also understand that it is a sensitive issue to talk about, especially to the custodians of the culture, which are mostly elders. Is there anything that is attached to, to initiating a girl that is important either for the lives of men, or the, the lives of, of, of Morans, of men as they grow old, or even the significance of female genital mutilation culturally, assuming that you are just coming to that culture and say, okay, why do you practice FGM and what significance is attached to female genital mutilation? Uh, basically, uh, I have, uh, we, have, we did uh, a baseline survey with African Accelerating Center for Abroadment of FGM based in Nairobi University. That's where now I learned a lot of things uh, because we know that the, uh, why the Samburu people cut just only for marriageability. And actually, when you ask men, why do you do this? The men will ask you. That, uh, that's a women issue. We don't know even why they'll cut. Go and ask the women. So sometimes men tend to keep themselves away from uh, FGM. And I know they're the custodian. But, uh, and the men, uh, when the elders will say no to FG, uh, the FGM will hand in Samburu, it will hand. But it is now our responsibility as organization uh, to know where to start with. Because we have Samburu Council of, of Elders. And uh, that's the best approach to go and reach the elders. Because once you reach the men, when the men say no to FGM, then it will end. Basically, also we need, we need also to uh, to to engage uh, to engage women because they they are the one who actually doing this. And uh, the reason behind all all this is only for marriageability and for someone to grow and being a woman, and also uh, uh, to attend Samburu community ceremonies. Basically, those are the only three important things. That's why Samburu people uh, pr practice FGM. You said attending a uh, ceremony. I'm assuming that, and in terms of even normally, you, we, you are just invited for a ceremony and you attend. Just give me a small brief of, of the ceremonies. Why is it important to, to, to be circumcised because of certain ceremonies? Is it that you graduate or something? Yeah, for girls is to graduate from, uh, uh, to, to graduate uh, from girlshood to womanhood. And uh, for her boy, from uh, being her boy to Horiawood, then definitely after 10 to 15 years, you'll, you will graduate to, to be a junior elder. That's the only. All right. So girls now, they know that once they are cut now, there are no more girls. They can behave like women or they can act like women. They are ready to get uh, married as women. Yes, actually, uh, FGM promote, ch uh, uh, promote child marriage. And definitely, one, you are cut, then definitely you are now allowed to be married, even if you are six to, 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 to seven years old, because you have already given that chance to be a woman. That's why there is the issue of child marriages in Samboro. And so now, on your journey, you've been working among these people for about uh, eight years now. And you've had a fair challenge, I'd assume, uh, dealing with the community, them believing that they have the tenets of, of culture deeply ingrained into their 
um, into, into their beings because they believe that, you know, I have to go through this practice to be considered a woman or probably to be regarded highly as a girl in this community. And even to be married and bring cows back home because that's what they, they, they've done over years and years. How has it been tried to challenge uh, something that some girls believe that they should undergo or some of them, their mother also believe, their mothers also believe that, you know, I, my, my daughter needs to undergo this because I underwent it and that's how it, it works in our community. How is it like challenging such, um, such norms in your community? Uh, actually, uh, ending FGM to require collective responsibility from everyone child, woman, warriors, elders, everyone in the co community, because it will involve you in one way or another. For example, the warriors, for example. I, I, I want to get that point well. How, 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 does, it, how does it involve them? Uh, in term, you know, the warrior, if I'm a warrior and I will decide that I will marry and cut girls, then definitely also I should involve my father. So it's all, uh, it, it, the mother and the father also, it will be involved in one way or another. So you must have a win-win situation, both f from your mom, no, f from your dad, from your mom, and from yourself. So it means that it's important to engage the warrior, the father and the mother, because sometimes the warrior might be willing not to marry a girl that's cut, uh, uh, but, but the father is pro he wants the girl to be cut and the mother maybe he also wants so it's you say that sometimes someone wants to marry someone that's not cut but the parents already had made that decision i think the key the key person there it will be you first and your father they're the one to, to, to decide if you'll marry and cut girls or not but you know people are di different with different perception you will decide as a person all that I'm educated. I know good about uncut girls, blah, blah, you know, or another. So you will just tell your dad, I'll marry uncut girl. And maybe your dad disagree with you. So that's why it, it requires uh, actually both of you to sit down and agree that my dad, I want to marry this and this and this. When will be given permission? Then that's the way to go. You know, it's important why I'm asking you having been born and raised in Samburu County is because I understand that in other cultures, you can decide to marry whoever you want to without really um, being considered an outlaw. But in Samburu culture in the past and traditionally, that's how they did it, just like the Maasai do. The girl that you choose is not just for you. It's like for your own community. And that's why it's important to be able to uh, get an understanding because sometimes mm -hmm. the parents also feel like if you marry the wrong person in courts, then you're going to shame the family. Is it the case? Yeah, yeah. It, is, it, is, it, it is actually very true. Even if you have a girl that you have loved for several years, so uh, uh, when you feel like that, you want to marry her, you need to consult your parent because they're the one who actually will advise you that this girl, she's from this family and this and uh, it's now the right girl for you because of this and this and this and this so in one way or another you sh uh, you must actually uh consider telling your dad that i love this lady i love this young girl and uh, i want to marry her we have stayed with her for seven years ten years uh, i'm so in love with her and i want to marry her so uh your dad must be told about that to advise you in one way or another. As a son of the soil, trying to end this practice that you were born seeing as a norm in your community, what are the challenges you've had uh, while trying to uh, engage the community or, uh, yeah, and how did you overcome them? Uh, actually, in 2012, when I started the Pastoral Rachel Foundation, it was a bit difficult for me, especially to have girls mentorship workshop. Because uh, I used uh, to inform the teachers, then I have the concerns from the parents as well. But around 40% of the parents sometimes says, oh, why do we have to send our girls, our young daughters to the FGM workshop? There is nothing they are going to tell them, only the FGM. But I saw there is a need of us to introduce a self-awareness topic, uh, HIV and AIDS topic, uh, important of education, topic as well, reproductive health, child marriage, etc., etc. 
uh, and sometime I, to- I, I told girls to take all those notes to your parent to see them that I'm not only teaching you about the FGM, we are also teaching you about a different thing, about the life, importance of ed- education, etc, etc. Et and uh, me being there, living with the co- co- community, my friends, uh, cousins also, sometimes when they see me, they will say, oh, he's an FGM person. FGM, even they will nickname me FGM. <laughs> <laughs> it has happened to me before too. They, they don't say it directly, but they say <laughs> But it, they say. one day uh, when we went to a youth camp with my friends, the youths, then we said that we are supposed to go and spend in one of the camp. When I wake up early in the morning, I wake up and my tents were written, Mr. FGM. So I was telling them, what? What the hell is this? Who wrote my tent, Mr. <laughs> FGM? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's 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 uh, it's, it's, it's some it's these are some of the practices sometimes. Uh, these are some of the challenges that we have to face sometimes while doing this work. And you keep going on every time. Um, how do you deal with such challenges, like approaching, for example, women, and they tell you, you know what, I have undergone this, and I have not seen any problems. Yes, those are the daily uh, questions and answers we shall get from the women. But uh, Pastoral Child Foundation as uh, qualified facilitators, which are women, we take them to different uh, uh, educational workshops whereby we also teach them how to approach the women, elders, in a best way that uh, they will not fight you back. And uh, definitely... Uh, we know that uh, back there at the village, most of our women actually have undergone the FGM. But we need also to involve them, to give us their stories, uh, and also challenge other women that this is good, this is bad. So we don't actually have to keep them away. We bring them to, together, and they will be our champions because they will speak for themselves, and they, they will as well speak for, for other women. And uh, using now the survivors to end FGM, I think that's the best approach as well. But it requires support uh, uh, from an organization, from an, an individual to help you to do more workshop in different villages and able to engage more people. Because uh, we are now targeting the new generation. And uh, those women have a responsibility in one way or another. So while we teach them, I know they will teach their daughters. And uh, we have hopes in, in them because some little women, they're so unique in their own way. They're very good listeners. And when they say no, they will say no. And uh, all of these require the best approach. Live with them peacefully. Empower them peacefully about the anti-FGM laws. And uh, you will see the changes slowly by slowly. So a, a multi-sectoral approach is important, is what you're trying to, to just say, uh, trying to involve them from a point of understanding. Yes, yes, because I think uh, we at Pastoral Child Foundation, we don't want a conflict whereby we see a mother and a father in the cell. Then we leave the children. Who, who will take care of those two children? Then uh, definitely now we will have the conflict between the organization that family. So we need to give police to do their own work. Let the police do their own work. Our work is to empower the community and give them the chance to change because they will change. They will change. Uh, but uh, we need to have the frequent, frequent uh, educational workshop, m- mentorship programs uh, for all of them. Mm-hmm. I know many people might not agree with the, uh, w- with such statements where uh, they say, you know, uh, these people should be given a chance to understand. And uh, I know many people who are pro arrest these people because they have committed a crime. But considering this is a, a community-based organization, then the goodwill of the people is important. Because, of course, if you try to work with people who you've taken to jail is a little bit difficult to, to deal with, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, the, the reason why I'm saying that, maybe you go to the interior village, whereby the community or those people at that village, they have not even visited uh, maybe town for like seven months. They don't know about the anti-FGM laws. 
they don't know about importance of education. So the best way is to go to that community and understand their need first. Uh, when you understand now their need, understand the approach they require for them. Uh, once you understand that they have this problem and this problem and this and this, then that's the only time that you can be able to chip in and uh, and introduce your topic because sometimes when you go to a certain village and there's drought people are moving from here and there they lack water and you yourself you go and introduce them the topic of fgm well that's suffering so you should first go there and consider what are their problem how will you help then from there you'll now find the best approach uh, to approach them to end fgm so we have to use the right process even if you are an activist you have actually to use the right process the shifts there let the shift do their work let the police do their work you, you as an organization you as an activist do your work consider also uh, balance the situation because i live in the community even if i get one to two challenges i know fgm is a sensitive issue so uh, we have to balance this thing and educate the community about these anti-FGM laws. And I know for sure they will change. What would you tell someone who's been working in this campaign, either solo or with, uh, in partnership with other people? Is there any piece of advice you'd share with any um, activists all over the world? Yeah, I would actually like to, I would, I would like to tell my fellow activists and other organizations who are working to end FGM that uh, ending FGM is, is a, a sensitive issue and it requires re a collective res responsibility from everyone. Uh, we need to press on, let's press on without fear. Let's help our community, let's help our girls, let's hel help our mamas because I know FGM will, will end. But our request also, uh, we, let's, let's use the best approach, let's empower them, let's keep this going and we will see FGM will end. If, if you'd like uh, someone to reach out to you, probably talk more about or even visit your organization, how, how would they be able to reach you? Our offices are based in Samburu County, Achas Post. And we, we have also an office in U.S., New Jersey. And uh, if you want to reach us, uh, you can go to info at pastorallychildfoundation.org or samuel at pastorallychildfoundation.org. Amazing. That was Samuel Yadismo. Amen, as I described him earlier. Uh, very beautifully um, dressed today. Say, I don't know what the event is here at the shows of the Atlantic Ocean. Ah, yeah, we're the, at the show of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we are in Senegal, and uh, yeah, it's a great day for youth all over the world because we are. it's the first uh, African conference to end FGM. And I was very much excited because I have my fellow Horia, Jeremy, I keep, keep on with me here. I'm so happy to see one of my colleagues uh, interviewing me with those things. That means the change is there. And I feel strong and I know we will hand FGM. That was Samuel Yadismo. Today we are dressed, as you can hear, I'm still very jingly today. Uh, he's also dressed the same. And we are here at the shores of the Atlantic Ocean here at Dakar in Senegal. Jeremiah Kipaino is my name, and thank you very much for joining me at the end FGM podcast. Till next time, stay safe and tune in to the end FGM podcast. You can find us on whatever platforms you get your podcasts from, Google Podcasts, or on my website on the category end FGM podcast. Thank you very much, and have a nice time. You can get bonus materials, notes, and much more at www.kipainoi.com. K I P A I N O I.com. Please remember, we all can do something. Go out and make a difference, for we all have a responsibility to make this world a better place. Goodbye.